We have uh, Antonio Garte uh, for the seminar. Um, I want to thank Antonio for offering to tell us something about this uh, wonderful instrument of Tocan. And Antonio, you know, Antonio, most of, most of you know him. Uh, he did uh, his PhD thesis here in the Institute working with Alberto Castro Tellado and Filippo Servi. Uh, in, and he finished in 2007, then he moved to ESO, Italy, and finally to Denmark to work in... Uh, all of you know that he has been very active in all the schools, so that he has been working high energy uh, gamma rivers most of the time, and recently uh, he is the leader of a new group in the Institute. Uh, the group uh, name is High Energy Transient and they host... Actually, the, the leader is Cristina. Well, the leader is Cristina. <laughs> Sorry, Cristina. <laughs> Sorry, Cristina. I was already told that he's been silent for years. He corrected me <laughs> about the group to belong to, so that... Uh, but, um, uh, it's Cristina, so I will take the opportunity to tell her very well because maybe some of, some of us uh, we don't know we don't know about uh, the new this new group, um, and so he uh, he will tell us something about the a new instrument for the Gemini. I think it's a very good opportunity to to hear. Thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Eva. So I'm going to speak today about uh, OctoCam. OctoCam is an instrument that we are working on right now. It's still in a very early phase, uh, but uh, by the end of this year, we should know if we are actually building the instrument or if we are not. So as I say here, uh, OctoCam is a fast, multi-channel imager and spectrograph that's uh, been prepared for the Gemini Observatory. So this uh, project has uh, a bit of history. It was, uh, it's been quite a few years since we thought the first concept of this instrument and uh, it evolved into what it is now. So the first very, very early concept that was still quite far from what it is now was presented in, in the call for new instrumentation for, uh, for Calar Alto in 2008 where uh, Carmenes was selected. That was, that was very early and that was still far from uh, being uh, the instrument that it is now. And then we did participate also, uh, presenting the instrument uh, as a new concept for the GDC telescope. That was in 2010. That was, uh, at, at the time, it was uh, Javier Gorosabel and myself uh, being PIs of this instrument. The, the study was presented, the feasibility study to, to GDC. Unfortunately, it was not accepted uh, to compete with the other instruments because, of, uh, because we were not meeting all the all the requirements in spectral resolution of the of the call, but still we did quite a lot of advance in that design, and we actually proposed it as visitor instrument for GDC the year after. We were in conversations with uh, with GDC. Unfortunately, this did not go forward either because uh, we failed to get a compromise of of uh, having a, a foci of the telescope allocated for this instrument uh, because of uh, of the constraints in uh, in other instrumentation that GDC had at the time. And of course, you, you cannot ask for the amount of money that we need for this instrument if you don't have a, a signed agreement. So, so at the time, we dropped it, but we began to explore other observatories. And uh, this is how we came to, to Gemini. And uh, as you know, Gemini is an observatory um, <coughs> constituted of, of two telescopes. There's one telescope in, uh, in Chile, one telescope in Hawaii, uh, in, uh, and uh, this is all managed by, by a consortium uh, of, uh, this is called AURA. AURA is the Association for universities, of Universities for Research in Astronomy. And uh, that's the, ma the manager of, of the, the observatory. It also manages other, other facilities. And actually, Gemini is a consortium of several countries. You see here, the main partner is the, the United States. But there's also Canada, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, South Korea, and Chile being the, the host of the uh, Gemini South Telescope. 
So the history of this call for new instrumentation goes back to the time, more or less, when we are proposing this instrument for, for uh, GDC. So Gemini has been looking for quite some time for a new instrument to build. And actually in 2012, I think it was, they had a, a meeting of, uh, of their uh, uh, people to, to look for uh, what instrument would be good to build. And uh, after, after that uh, meeting was held, they decided to issue this uh, call for new uh, instruments. I'll give you more details on what was uh, uh, requested at that time, or what was recommended at that time. The call was finally issued in 2014, in, uh, at the end of the year, and uh, we figured out that it was uh, a good opportunity to present our instrument. And uh, this is the, the Gemini Instrument Feasibility Study, that's the GIFs. And there were quite a few projects presented, and four of which were selected, and, uh, and uh, Octocam was one of them that was selected and, uh, and funded. So we had that feasibility study funded, which was uh, developed over the last year, over two, uh, 2015. And the final feasibility study that you, that you have here uh, was presented in, in Hawaii in September and the final version handed in in October. <coughs> right now, uh, Gemini is, is uh, thinking about what they want to uh, produce as the final instrument. And uh, with these four feasibility studies, they are now going to issue a call for an instrument design. So looking at the characteristics, at what's feasible, what's not feasible, what uh, characteristics they will have, they would like to have, they will issue a call. They would give the characteristics and people would be able to present their projects. If these characteristics that they request meet the, the possibilities of our instrument, maybe with some variations, we will present Dr. Cam and, uh, and hope uh, to be selected. And the instrument that gets selected there uh, would be the one that uh, would be designed and ultimately built. So uh, we will probably know about the, 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 this decision of what instrument is going to be built after summer. The call should be issued any day. There was actually, this morning there was some information at the webpage saying that they will be meeting, having several meetings during this month. So probably uh, beginning in April or so, I guess uh, the call would come out. The instrument should be at the telescope after a building period of around five years. So we expect to have the instrument at the telescope in the, in the early 2020s, 22, 23. That's the, that's the, the initial idea. It will all depend on the on, on how all these calls and resolutions uh, come around. So uh, who this decide, call... Who decides? Who decides? Is this a, a special commission? There, there is a committee that's been designed specifically to, to uh, create this call for instrument design. So the, this request for proposal. An internal committee. It is, an, it is, well, are, it is internal, internal within the community. Mm -hmm. So they select people within the community that uh, some representatives of, of different uh, parts of the community that get together and of the telescopes and get together and decide of the, about the characteristics as they want they want to issue. So they, they are, actually they, they also follow the recommendations of several committees because this has been reviewed by, the, by, by a, a certain panels. The final result was sent to, to the, the, um, the stack committee, which uh, I don't remember what stack uh, meant right now. Uh, but it's another committee that uh, looks at it and decides, okay, uh, our conclusion is that we like these characteristics and we're going to prioritize uh, a broadband spectrograph with a specific resolution or something like that. And with that, these other committees, a lot of committees, uh, meets together and creates the document of the, of the call for proposals. So uh, this call, this is the call of the GIFs, the one that was issued in 2014, uh, was based on the, on the meeting of 2012-2013 where they were recommended to look for a workhorse instrument, an instrument that should be science driven, so it's not technologically driven so we can do this and what science can we do with that, no, we want to have a lot of science cases, a lot of uh, science interests and with that build an instrument. So it's, it's a different approach, that they've done it before just to go for a specific science, in this case they wanted something very broad. The instrument cost should be between 8 and 12 million US dollars with a modest technical risk. So in this case, they want to go for an instrument that would be secure, that could be built in a specific time, and, and that would not 
necessarily develop any new technology which could be delaying the project. <coughs> it should be highly efficient. Of course, if you have an 8-meter telescope, you want to use that, 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 those photons that arrive. You don't want to lose any of those. Uh, so you want to keep that advantage. And one of the things that that, that uh, uh, meeting uh, brought out is that a wide bandwidth, moderate resolution, which is kind of ambiguous, but that's why they wanted to keep it a bit ambiguous, ambiguity there, uh, spectrograph would be kind of the most compelling instrument for this, uh, for this case, which actually matched very well to the instrument that we, were, that we had in our hands. And let me present you now the, the AutoCAM team. As uh, Pepa said, the project is led from, from here, from this institute, from the IAA, in particular from the HEF group. Uh, so I'm the PI of the, of the project, and uh, Cristina Tone is the project manager in Spain. We have uh, very, uh, our main partners are from the Southwest uh, Research Institute. Some of you who probably uh, recognize the name, others maybe not, but you probably know missions like New Horizons, that was uh, their responsibility. So they've been doing mostly space uh, missions, but now they are also interested in going also into ground-based instrumentation, and they're being uh, uh, really incredible partners because they have a lot of knowledge uh, they are kind of going from a, a very high level, a bit uh, and down to a simpler project. Our, our, well, uh, I have to say, Pete Roaming is co-PI there and is the project manager in the US. And uh, let me introduce also Susan Pope, who is the systems engineer, a really amazing uh, uh, um, uh, engineer. So uh, our uh, instrument scientist is Alexander van der Horst. Uh, he has been a really, really great uh, instrument scientist. I'll show you now the, the, the amazing science team that he has put together. He's from the uh, George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, at the IAA, as you know, we are, we are uh, quite low in, in, uh, in personal and in instrumentation side, so we could not base our designs, uh, we could not develop the designs at home, but on the other hand, we do have in Spain some companies with, uh, with a lot of experience and, and power to, to take care of this. So we, we uh, hired a Fractal uh, with Marisa, Ernesto and, and Manuel, where we're developing the optomechanical design. So they, they, it was a very big chunk of the, of the work that they undertook. We've also having, been having support from INA from Italy. Uh, from Andrea Bianco, Alberto Riva, mainly on the on the development of the of the Grisons, and from some, for some add-ons, we've conducted uh, world experts of those specific uh, areas. So Robert Content uh, is uh, been taking care of the IFU. Uh, he he's been uh, doing uh, a lot of IFU designs since since 20 years, uh, and and he's a real expert. Uh, on the other hand, Franz Nick. Is uh, been taking care of has been taking care of the of the spectropolarimeter. He's one of the world experts in in, in polarimetry, and uh, you'll see it's, uh, he's proposing really amazing things. And I don't want to go any further without a. Uh, uh, oh, let me first. Uh, oh, that's the the science team. You see, we've put together uh, 46 science <coughs> team members that covers uh, science cases from the solar system, our galaxy, exoplanets. Um, uh, X-ray binaries, uh, galaxies, cosmology, supernovae, gamma ray bursts. So we, we do cover a very, very broad uh, uh, range of uh, science cases. I don't want to go any further without uh, uh, remembering uh, Javier in this uh, in this uh, work. As I said before, Javier was co-PI of this project and and uh, was really pushing this project forward and. Uh, and uh, well, it's uh, it's his project. So there we are at the DDC where we are trying to negotiate for having it as a as a um, visitor instrument uh, with uh, with one of these documents. That's the actually the original one that we presented to 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 DDC. And uh, unfortunately, I also have to to uh, say a word about uh, Peter Curran, a very good friend, very good scientist also specialist in gamma ray bursts and x-ray binaries. He was part of a science team. And unfortunately, he also passed away a few weeks ago for something very similar as, as Javier. It's been a really tragic year. So uh, let me go back to the, to the talk and, uh, and the, the instrument. 
This uh, project is trying to cover the scientific needs that we will have in the 2020s. So it will be a time when, when these 8 meter telescopes that have been the leaders of uh, observational astrophysics over the last years become uh, some kind of more secondary, if you want, that they have to at least uh, take different roles. So their roles might be to support uh, the observations that cannot be done in those telescopes, the output of uh, large surveys like uh, LSST, uh, it, will be, it will be kind of a different role. And for that role, that's what, what they wanted, uh, a workhorse instrument that could uh, take care of many, many, many science cases. The idea is, as I said before, a simultaneous optical and near infrared uh, instrument that would also uh, do a good work in time domain astrophysics, which is so in fashion right now. It's, it's a very exciting field. And uh, we want to take the experience that we have in building instruments that have some similarities with this to produce an instrument that goes some steps further uh, <coughs> with, a new, with a new concept. So yeah, using the experience, but trying to improve as much as we can. Uh, those are the science topics. As I said, they are, they are very, very broad. You can see, probably you'll find something that you can relate to. And if not, you can probably uh, do a lot of science with uh, this instrument. The, among those science cases, we have selected uh, some main science drivers that are the ones that, that uh, when you have compromises to make, you have to favor in some way those science cases. I and mean, in this case, the, we do want to have very fast and efficient characterization of transients. Uh, we want to study and, uh, and, and uh, give uh, new insight to extreme astrophysical phenomena such as gamma reverse, supernovae, X-ray binaries, magnetars. Uh, we also want to do a, a, a very significant work in, in the origin of, uh, of our solar system, studying comets, asteroids, Trans-Neptunians uh, eclipses that, that are high time resolution, for example. Uh, we want to do uh, good advances also using the time resolution and the multi-band capabilities in astroseismology. Uh, we want to go to the first generation of stars, which probably also uh, uh, merges a bit with uh, some of these phenomena. Looking at the first generation of stars and their environments, we want to then look for the evolution of the universe from the get first star from the first galaxies uh, until our days. So let me now go to the actual concept of OctoCam. That's the Gemini telescope. <coughs> and uh, what we want to do is multiply the power of that telescope. So the way in which we do this is that we want to split the light with uh, dichroics, with very highly efficient big dichroics, and <coughs> multiply the power of that telescope, in our case, by eight. So we're getting the light, splitting it, and using it efficiently, like if we are having not one telescope, but eight telescopes. We are going to have a wide wavelength coverage. You can see that it's from 3,700 to 23,500 angstroms. So from the beginning of the ultraviolet to the, to the K-band, the near infrared. And here, as I said before, we're trying to use the experience of uh, previous instruments. We, we are trying to invent as little as we need to invent, but trying to put together a lot of things to create something that's completely new and that has all the advantages and as little as the inconveniences of, uh, of those instruments. So we are inheriting multiband imaging from in instruments like, uh, like Grand at the 2.2 in, in, uh, in La Silla, the Brockman spectroscopy of Exhuter, learning some lessons, trying to improve some things, uh, using the high time resolution of Ultracam, that you might also know, also in, in several channels, and uh, putting all this together, ground extruder, ultracam, and some more things that you will see now, that's where we create or we find the, the space for octocam. That is actually a space in the temporal resolution spectral uh, coverage and spectral resolution diagram that's not really covered by any, by any other instrument in the world today, and for sure not in an 8 meter telescope. The instrument diagram is, is more or less as follows here. So we have uh, the light coming from the telescope through an atmospheric dispersion corrector. And then we have two main units. So that's the, the near infrared, which is actually a cryostat. That's, that's cold from there on. Uh, we have the, a single slit, so that's the focal plane. You have the slits, the IFU, the polarimeter coming in. And then you have the first dichroic. The dichroic is, is a filter, it's an optic, that 
uh, splits the light. So it will let the near infrared pass and reflect the, the optical light with very high efficiency. So you just lose a couple percent, a few percent uh, at most. Then we continue splitting the light in the, to, towards the different arms. There are four infrared arms, Y, J, H, K, and, it, and the, the optical light comes out of the cryostat into a, a room temperature uh, uh, enclosure. And there we have the same structure, only that this is at room temperature. Each of the arms, schematically, because then you'll see that there are some optics that are shared, etc. Uh, it's a classical uh, instrument with a collimator, a Grissom filter wheel, a camera that focuses the, the light onto the, onto the detector. And those are more or less the scheme for all the arms. That's the, a view of the, of the mechanical design. That box here is part of the telescope. So it goes in the Cassegrain uh, cell. So the telescope would be above. And that's, the, that's a box in which they have a mirror that distributes in four pores, actually five, there's one below also, uh, the, the light into the different instruments. The instrument has a, a cage, a support frame, and, and that's the instrument with the two uh, infrared and optical uh, benches. That's our electronic boxes. And uh, if you look inside, you can see there's a lot of uh, a little opti elements of optics, but uh, it looks complicated, but it's actually very, a very simple instrument. So what we're looking here is an instrument that's efficient, that's simple, that's uh, compact and lightweight, and uh, with the minimum amount of moving parts. The less moving parts, the less complexity that you give to the instrument, the less problems it's going to give. So we do this by having high efficiency dichroics and, and uh, BPH prisms. Uh, we try to constrain the pupil size as small as we can. That, that reduces the size and weight of the, of the instrument. And we have a single long slit. So we don't have problems of uh, differential flexure between the different arms in the, in the entrance of the light. Uh, in some cases, the optics are shared by different arms. And, in some, and, and uh, the optics are also tried to be optimized uh, to each of the specific wavelength ranges, so you can be as uh, efficient as you can. The optical design is a bit more detailed here. You, have, you see the two, the two areas, the two benches. There's the near infrared and the optical one, and here you see them from, uh, from above and below. Or being a, a Cassegrain instrument, I don't really know what above and below means. We do have an atmospheric dispersion corrector, which is an important element that allows you to observe with that uh, long slit in any, in any uh, angle. Uh, as I said, common focal plane, the very high efficient decroics and, and grisms. And with the feasibility study, we've managed to achieve a very uh, satisfactory optical quality and, uh, and quite uh, good uh, efficiency, especially if you consider that we're having uh, eight simultaneous arms observing. Again, I, I, I show you the, the mechanical design a little. Uh, so I already explained this. If we take the instrument that can come out of the, of the cage, we are left with, with this. That's the cryostat up here, and the, near, and the visible arm down here. That's the entrance of the light to so the atmospheric dispersion corrector. Inside the, the near-infrared chamber, there is a, a, a radiation shield to, to help keep the, the temperature constrained. And that's the view to the inner part of the infrared arm. That's the focal plane carriage. This is the first dichroic that separates the infrared light that stays here and the optical that goes through this hole to the lower part. And uh, here you begin to have the, the optics, the first optics. That's the, the first lens of the, of the collimator that is shed by the forearms. Then we have the first splitting dichroic, I mean the second, after this one. And uh, another element of the, of the collimator the grisms or filters, and then the cameras focusing on the, on the detector. And that's, of course, represented in all, in all the arms. Here you can see a bit more detail, uh, the focal plane carriage, and, uh, and the part of the, the end, where you have the collimated beam, the carriage, that if you see, it carries, it carries uh, two grisms simultaneously, and, they, and that's one single movement. So we have uh, less complexity and less, uh, less uh, moving parts, especially in the cryogenic chamber, you want to have as less moving parts as you, as you can deal with. This is the visible arm, so that will be underneath the, the bench that we saw before, just mm, side to side, and, uh, and the scheme is very similar. So you have another dichroic here, the collimator uh, first optics, 
folding mirrors. We have quite a few folding mirrors in order to keep the design very compact. We also wanted to keep it very, very symmetrical and close to the to the bench. So when we deal with the, with the flexures, the the flexures will be very coupled between the different arms. And that's the cryostat of the uh, visible optics. So they have a, a single uh, connected cryostat that uh, we found to be more efficient. We also uh, considered that we will need to have uh, access to several of the, of the parts of the instrument. So that's the design of, of some uh, accessibility uh, doors. And that's the, the focal plane that will carry. Uh, this is the, the slit carriage. And then there are several uh, gaps for uh, several spaces for the IFU unit for the spectropolarimeter. The infrared uh, cryogenic chamber is cooled by two helium plus uh, cryo coolers that he, you see that they stick out of the into the visible uh, arm, so they are accessible from there. As for the imaging, now going to a more practical sense, not so technical, uh, we doing imaging in eight bands, as I said. They are the, the standard slow bands here I set, and in the infrared we have a YJHKS, okay, short. So you can see here the, the coverage that's all done simultaneously. And uh, simultaneously, is, is, simultaneity is a very important word for, for this instrument. It, uh, when you need to do things at the same time, this, I think this cannot be beaten. We're using frame transfer detectors in the optical, and uh, the latest generation of Hawaii 2 RG. Uh, detectors with sidecar electronics in the near infrared. This allows us to go very fast, very efficient. In the case of the frame front transfer detectors, we can be exposing and reading at the same time, which basically gets rid of overheads. That's, I mean, if we want to use the time of a telescope, spending half an hour each night uh, just reading out the camera uh, is not efficient. And uh, if you're going to do very short exposures because you want to go high time resolution, you do not want to spend time reading out your camera. So in that, in that sense, this instrument will be very efficient for, for uh, uh, operations. Uh, in that sense, like what I was saying, the, the overheads are very, very uh, small. That's, that's a, 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 an idea of the limiting magnitudes that you can reach with the instrument. So you can think about the kind of targets that you, that you can use. That's for high time resolution when that's one second. That's a, a relatively high resolution <coughs> and a half an hour exposure. The field of view is 3 by 3 arc minutes, which at first could not seem huge. I mean, you compare it with Demos, that's the other optical instrument at, uh, at Gemini, or Flamingos 2, which is the near infrared camera with a wider field of view. They are both around 30 square arc minutes. If you think about an instrument like, like uh, Osiris at GDC, that's around 60, 60 arc minutes, something like that. Uh, in, in our uh, square arc minutes. In our case, it's three by three, but you have to consider that we don't have just one detector. We have eight of those. So actually, the, the, the field that we have is around 72 square arc minutes, which is actually a bit, even, a bit bigger than that. Uh, so if you want to do a survey in eight filters, you're going much faster with this instrument. And uh, you can do science that, uh, like uh, what Grund is doing, but taking it into a different scale different step, much more efficient, much bigger telescope. In spectroscopy, we're going from 3,700 to 23,500. So uh, why 3,700? Why don't we go down to 3,000? Maybe some of you are thinking. OK, this is uh, due to technical reasons. Uh, that's the transmit, uh, transmission of, uh, of, the, of the atmosphere. So that's, that's what we see. So in theory, yes, we could go down to 3,000. That's what the atmosphere allows. But uh, Gemina has the peculiarity that it has a silver coating. So this is the, the efficiency of uh, Gemini with three mirrors, the primary, secondary, and the tertiary that fits the instrument. You can see here that, well, this coating is by far the best coating that a, a, a 8 meter, 10 meter telescope has in the world, above 4,000 angstroms. It's very efficient. The problem is that below 4,000 angstroms, it draws very, very sharply. If you combine those two curves that I, that I just showed, you can see that below 3,700, we are below 25% uh, efficiency. So the phones that we get there are very, very small, very, very few. So, so we decided to cut there and, and leave that as a limit. In any case, if we have this range, we can observe things like O2 uh, already at rates of zero. Uh, we can observe O2 and H alpha simultaneously 
at any redshift from 0 to 2.5. We can go for extinguished uh, sources thanks to the, the infrared coverage or very high redshift. Uh, as I said, the VPH, the, the grisms are very efficient. So we're using VPH, the volume phase holographic gratings, which uh, are very, very efficient if used in a small uh, wavelength range. In our case, we're using wavelength ranges that are of the order of a flow and filter. So in that regime, these, uh, these prisms are, are, are unbeatable. The resolution that we are thinking about is a uh, 3 4,000 uh, resolution, delta lambda over lambda. I mean, lambda over delta lambda. And uh, this resolution is chosen because in the infrared, you want to go to look uh, in between the, the skylines, and you need a resolution of around 3,000 to do that in an efficient way. That way we can, we can look for, a, for a, con the continuum of very faint sources in the infrared. And with that resolution, you can begin to do studies of uh, velocity components. I mean, uh, it's not enough to, to do void profile feeding, for example, but then you need to go to, to significantly higher 20,000, 40,000 uh, in resolution. So uh, we believe that that was a very good compromise. And there's a lot of science to be done in that, uh, in that regime. We have a slit of two arc minutes. That's the, um, the estimated limiting magnitudes on Gemini for 10 second exposures and uh, for one hour exposures. That's a three, uh, 10, uh, 10 uh, signal, uh, a signal to noise of 10. And that's the resolution. That's the, the thick line that you see here. That's, uh, you can see that it's, uh, it's quite uniform from uh, the optical to the infrared. We do have an atmospheric dispersion corrector. This is a very complicated problem because having a, an atmospheric dispersion corrector that allows you to work in this broad regime is very complicated. So we're still trying to improve the efficiency of that, but we managed to get something that, that can do the job uh, in a quite good way. And uh, we'll be able to, to reproduce some of the <coughs> works that are being done with Acuter right now, but uh, with higher efficiency and much <coughs> higher cadence and uh, much more uh, um, time resolution, yeah. So in order to reach these resolutions, spectral resolutions, we had to use some, uh, some old trick because uh, we did not have enough pixels. So what we're doing is that we're using a different detector area for imaging and for spectroscopy. So the central area, so th this is, this is the, the visible detector, which, has, which is actually a 2K by 1K, with two masked areas for a, a frame transfer. We use the 1K by 1K at the center for imaging, you can see it here, and we use the 2K by 1K for spectroscopy. Actually, we have the instrument corrected so that it goes to the corner, so you could actually use a bigger area for imaging, if you don't mind the, the fact that it's, uh, a bit, uh, that it's not gonna be square. So it could go even a bit, uh, a bit bigger. That allows us to go to, to twice the resolution, using the, the same plate scale. Frame transfer detectors in the, in the optical, near infrared with the ACR by sidecar and sidecar. And here you have a, a, a diagram with the exposure times in each of the channels and uh, marked the readout noise. So the standard readout noise, very low readout noise, like any classical telescope, we would be uh, going down to five second exposures. If you wanna go below, uh, we can go all the way down to uh, full frame at 10 hertz. It depends a bit on the, on the, on the arm. I mean, uh, but there's a price to pay. If you wanna go very fast, you have to assume that you're gonna get higher uh, readout noise, or higher electronic noise. So uh, if you are willing to assume that, you can go, as I said, uh, 10 hertz uh, full frame in all, the, in all the arms, and even a bit higher, even up to uh, 100 uh, hertz or so, if you're willing to go in window mode. Uh, a really cool thing is that one of our uh, um, uh, collaborators, Vic Dillon, is now developing an instrument that, uh, that uh, is called Hypercam with, uh, with an ERC grant. And uh, he's using the same detectors for a, a very high time resolution instrument. And they are doing a beautiful uh, development of, uh, of those detectors. So by the time we arrive, there will be a lot of uh, attention <coughs> in that. Of course, this is a great uh, uh, capabilities for uh, for uh, X-ray binaries, for magnetars, gamma ray bursts. What can I say? Uh, occultations, transits. If you can do all that at those speeds in all the bands simultaneously, that that opens uh, new science windows. 
that's a, a, a summary of the performance in that's efficiency. I'll, I'll show it better in, in, in some figures. Uh, this is the efficiency of the instrument. That's when you consider only optics. That's the optics of the instrument. So you can see here for imaging in blue and for spectroscopy in red. Uh, the efficiency goes, of course, down once you put the detectors. One of the limiting ones is the, the Z-band that we're still uh, working on the coding for that one. Maybe we can go a bit higher. And uh, once you put the, the telescope, you see that it falls on the, on the bluer part due to the effect that I saw before. But it's still quite a reasonable efficiency. Again, you have here the, the diagrams that you saw before. If you want to try to figure out your science cases, how they fit in, in that, uh, in that um, scheme of uh, limiting magnitudes. And now I go to some of the add-ons that the instrument has. What we've seen up until now is the basic uh, characteristics of the instrument. Uh, as we have a single focal plane and a long slit, we can think about adding uh, new uh, uh, utilities for the, for the new add-ons, new capabilities for the instrument. So one of them is the spectropolar imager. This is very exciting. This is uh, something that has never done, been done before and it's based on the, on the design that Franz Nick thought for a shooter that was published in 2012. That was never built, but he managed to prove that a spectropolarimeter that covers from 3,700, or in our case, to 22,000 angstroms is possible. Uh, people were trying up to now to make a chromatic uh, spectropolarimeter. So, and that's very difficult. And with those ranges, it's basically impossible. So his approach was different. What he did uh, was uh, to use, well, it's based on, on, as you see here, a modulator and a subat plate. The modulator is not achromatic, but it's polychromatic. So what you do is that you allow it to be chromatic, to have different uh, polarization uh, effects at different wavelengths, but you know how they are. So after doing the observation and after observing at different angles, you can reconstruct the polarization at all, at all the wavelengths. And, uh, and uh, as I said, this has not been done and it would be very exciting to be able to have it. There's also the possibility of doing high-speed polarimetry for continuum. So if you modulate a very high frequency, you can then reconstruct from a single observation the full spectral polarimetry. Although, as you're using adjacent pixels to get different uh, polarimetry capability, uh, uh, properties, uh, the reconstructed spectrum is, of course, much lower resolution. But if you just want to go for the continuum, that, that uh, will give a really impressive uh, uh, high time resolution uh, spe uh, spectral polarimetry. This is uh, very demanded by, by supernovae people, by stellar physics, and uh, of course, characterizing transients is also very interesting uh, to have the, the polarimetry. Finally, the integral field unit, and this is one of the things that, that I'm more excited about. This is uh, based on the advanced image slicer. This is a design that's based on using many small mirrors uh, to take the, the image from the focal plane onto a pseudo slit. This is uh, what, for, for example, Muse that you probably know at VLT is using a, a similar design to this. Most of the uh, most modern uh, IFUs use uh, image slicers like uh, based on this advanced image slice of the shine. Uh, in our case, the design is a 9.7 times 6.8 uh, area with, uh, uh, slit lips, with slit lips of 0 0.4 arc seconds. That, of course, delivers you the full resolution of the, of the instrument uh, with any seeing. And, uh, and uh, you, can, you can reconstruct uh, this area. And, uh, uh, we have also thought about some alternatives. Well, this, is, this would be, as to my knowledge, the only uh, IFU that covers such a broad wavelength range on, on, on such a large telescope. We've also thought about the possibility of, of trying to cover as much field as possible uh, with a wider <coughs> slitlets, although you lose some spectral resolution, but you cover a bigger area and, uh, and um, still the full uh, wavelength area. <coughs> and using the, the really extraordinary adaptive optics capabilities of uh, Gemini, we could consider the possibility of doing an adaptive optics uh, IFU. So receiving the light with adaptive optics, uh, taking the light from that and re-imaging it on the slit uh, for an area of 2.5 by 3.5 arc seconds 
with resolution of 0.08 arc seconds. Without, that would be amazing also. That's more or less the mechanical design, it's about this size. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, then we go to operations of this instrument. Calibrating and maintaining OctoCam. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I've worked on observatory and I think an instrument like this would be kind of the, the instrument you'd like to work with because it's simple, a few moving parts, there are very few in, uh, interventions that you have to do. You don't have to change any optical elements. Uh, the calibration, the daytime calibrations are, are basically simultaneous. <coughs> you observe uh, whatever calibration images you have to do, you do it in all the arms simultaneously. So in a few seconds you have everything. The readout is negligible. Uh, you also have few modes, so, so in a very, very early in the morning you'll be able to have all the calibrations finished. The, the night calibration is the same. If you need to observe a standard star, you observe once and you have all the filters observed in the standard stars. You put it on the slit, take a spectrum and you have the full spectral range card and, and calibrated. Go to your science object, don't lose time in, in, the, in the calibrations. And uh, on the other hand, we have very reliable flux calibration. Each time you obtain a spectrum of your source, you have images in eight channels. That that's, has proved to be quite critical also in next shooter, for example, where the uh, cross calibration between all the arms for faint objects is, is, is tricky. It can be done, but it's tricky. If you have uh, acquisition images done by a science camera in all the arms, uh, it's straightforward and very, very solid. The pipeline is going to be very simple. We have we have imaging and a long slit spectrograph that's as simple as it gets. So, so that, that will take basically no effort. And uh, operating it is also very comfortable. You have real time SEDs of whatever object you're seeing. You have a high time resolution variability char characterization basically in real time. You do the acquisition again in eight bands simultaneously. So you have no problem. Okay, my object is, is very red, so I'm not gonna see it in the acquisition camera, or it's very faint. Uh, so I don't see it in a, in a non-science camera. You have the science camera for doing imaging. You, you basically never will need, or very few cases you will need to use blind offsets. This, in my case, that would be the ideal tool for looking for high reset gamma ray bursts. And for gamma ray bursts, you don't know what reset you're gonna get. You don't know in which band you're gonna see it. So you just go there, you have all the bands. You see, you point, you, you get a spectrum. That's, that's uh, fantastic. And uh, you can also, if you, if you just want to go the ultimate fast uh, observation, you can just put the IFU and not even correct anything. You obtain spectroscopy as you're pointing the telescope. The IFU has the, uh, a field of view that's, that's bigger than the pointing accuracy of the telescope. You just point, shoot, get spectrum. So now let me just play around a bit and take you to uh, sometime 2022. Let's dream a bit when we have the telescope already uh, with the instrument installed. and. Uh, let me show you a bit of what we're going to see when we are observing. So you choose your favorite object, your favorite galaxy, and uh, you're going to have your image. You can click here, here. You can be doing simultaneous exposures, different times, whatever you, you will. So you can click in one of the bands, you see your bands. You can place your slit as you like. You can place your, your spectropolarimeter, your IFU unit area. You just put your object there and, and start exposing. You can have, yes, you have several bands simultaneously. You can also choose to see it in color. You can choose to see in color in, in optical, in infrared, as you like. You choose the bands. And uh, you're doing your observations and then you get some alert of someone annoying calling you to observe a gamma ray burst, for example. Who can I say? Maybe uh, some LSST target that has been identified or whatever. Uh, so in this case, uh, yeah, it's a GOB alert, for example. You have your observation. Yeah, you're observing color in the optical. You don't see anything. As I said before, we have the eight bands. So you can have a look at the, at the different bands and you can see that, okay, it's not in the optical, but you can see that there's something that seems to be appearing there. So if I choose the, the infrared channels, there is indeed an object there. And that looks like it's gonna be an interesting object that's only seen in H and K band. So you put your slit on, you obtain a spectrum, and there you have, okay, nothing here, but you have an H band and K band spectrum with high signals noise. And uh, that's a case of a real uh, object that could have been, that could be done. I mean. Uh, placed at a received uh, of 11.5. That, that would be easily done with such an instrument. And that's not so easy to be done with any <coughs> other instruments right now. Because uh, acquiring, finding the target, doing everything, putting the slit and such, is, uh, it's only possible if you have the capability of doing it all simultaneously in all these bands. So with this I'm going to finish. I'm just going to leave here the, the specifications of the, 
of the instrument and uh, we can discuss a bit, we can talk. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Questions? The filters. No, you can you can you can expose differently in each of the arms. Yes, but you don't want to be a camera even so not doing anything while the others are observing. Or you would probably be obtaining more data. Yeah. So so you would be exposing uh, not synchronously. So you want you can have thirty seconds in one filter and and hundred and eighty in the other one. Mm -hmm. So by the time you finish this one, you've obtained you've obtained uh, several exposures on the other one. Okay, uh, yes, that could be done. The problem is that that can be done for a specific target. So if you have just the that you're going to observe, yes, you're going to observe objects that are uh, intrinsically red. So you could just give a broader band uh, range to, to the, to the bluer filters and, and that would work. On the other side, you have uh, let me see. I don't know. You have other objects that are extremely blue, and uh, I cannot think of, uh, of a specific case right now. But but there are objects that are very blue. So in, you would need the opposite. I mean, uh, so you can have very extinguished sources, or you can have uh, emission lines that dominate. You can have very different science cases. In this case, we are going for an instrument that is wants to serve as many people as possible. So we are going for something as standard as possible. We use Sloan which is what we're tending all to go nowadays. So Johnson Cousins are being more abandoned. In this case, we could not even use them because uh, they are broader, they, they overlap. And in case of the case of the slow-hand filters, they, are, they, they can be used simultaneously, you, you mentioned that. Uh, because they, they, are, they, are, they are made in a way that, that there's no overlapping, so, so, or very little. So you can use them simultaneously. So that's why we chose that. We want to be as standard as possible. And uh, on the other hand, we have one set of filters. We're not changing filters, so uh, we want to be as standard as possible. Thank you. Hey, thanks uh, for a very nice talk. Um, so, if I understood properly, uh, now Jim and I will issue a new call with a list of top level requirements that the instrument will have to fulfill, whatever instrument. Um, so uh, you will have to get those top level requirements and redesign the instrument according to, I suppose, all these top level requirements. You will have to fulfill all of them, uh, not just part of them, but all of them. Uh, and then from there, what happens next? Do you have to go to a next to a new 
phase A study, I suppose you, you, you have to. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to work with Gemini. And then, um, starting with this new phase A study, in six years, you want, it is supposed that the instruments will have to be at the telescope in six, six years. Mm -hmm. Is that compatible with the time scale that you are doing for the yeah. The design and manufacturing of the instrument. Okay, and so so this is yeah. This is a, okay, let me let me try to go through through all the question. Uh, so the 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 call is going to be now any day. Let's see when it when it comes out. And we do not know very much the details. We've been told many things, and the way it come out comes out might be different. So uh, they will select. And, and, and they have said they've been more complex here, more complicated here. They've said that they will select one or two instruments for the for the design. So this is going to be like a phase A or something like that. Uh, and they select one or two. But they will they will fund the phase A study and uh, and um, and then either they select just one or if they select two, there will be a down selection at the end of phase A. Uh, if this is going to be compatible with having the instrument at that time. Well, it depends on when they resolve all the calls, when the contracts are signed, and uh, it will depend also on the instrument. So it depends on how advanced is the design of the instrument. Uh, I think we're quite advanced at the moment we are. So, and they, they actually wanted to be flexible there from what they said. I mean, we'll have to see what, what comes out in the end. <laughs> but uh, they would be willing to, to shorten uh, some, of the <clears throat> some of the studies if there's no need for more time. I mean, if we have already a, a design that's quite advanced, then uh, maybe we can we can finish off the phase A design faster than 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 what would usually be done. Uh, I mean, the the studies that we have now and that other teams also have are, are by now I think relatively in good shape, so it wouldn't take that much to go. Of course, yeah, uh, the 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 schedule is, is tight, and as we know, uh, those schedules tend to slide. We are quite confident that we can do our instrument in the time that we asked for, that we proposed. Uh, also because what we are asking for is quite simple. We have uh, things that can be done in many different companies. We don't have any unique item that, apart from the detectors, perhaps the infrared detectors that are basically one company that does them. Uh, we have uh, several vendors that could take care of uh, several orders simultaneously. So we're confident that uh, it could be built quite fast. Actually, the project manager from Southwest is, is confident that we can do it in like like two thirds of the time, which I I don't believe. But <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I think it can be done. But of course, you have to you have to put uh, all your effort into it. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to depend more on them than on us, according to the experience that we have. Okay, so for the infrared, I guess you take standard detectors, teledyne or something, or think about any low noise of these selects or whatever. We, we are, we've been thinking just of Hawaii2RG with uh, sidecar electronics. And the, so the, the, when you go between the filters, just curiously, for, out of curiosity, the, diff, the, the astrometric precision that you get between the different filters, will you have the same object on the same pixel? Can you? Make that, or will you have to do some kind of calibration then uh, on sky? Most of the optics are basically symmetric, are basically the same optics, just tuned to the. But how do you assure them? I mean, you. Have, I mean, basically, you 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 think you will be able to have the same the object the same pixel on each chip? You you mean the, you're talking more about the optics or the alignment? The align, I mean, basically, my question is as an astronomer, I'm not a user, I'm not in, the, in these trends. I just wonder whether I look at a star, will it be at the same pixel position in all the channels? <sighs> I don't have the. Because the... you said something about no blind searches, so if I point something, imagine an instrument that I know exists in one of the bands but not in the others, and I pointed it, would I expect that the same pixel to show up in the other channels? I'm I'm thinking about it. I don't I don't want to lie to you here because I would just say yes, of course. But very important. no, but curious. I mean, uh, optically, yes, because the optics are the same, and that would be more of an alignment issue. I mean, even with differential atmospheric refraction, etc. So, so there's many. Well, yeah, wait. I mean, well, we do have atmospheric dispersion correction, 
I mean, in the, the case of infrared, you wouldn't really need much. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that that's, depends on, on the elevation that you go. I mean, th that is something that is it's, it's there. So, so no, I, it's, there I have to say no. I mean, you're not going to have the sound, the same pixel in K-band and U-band if you go to low elevation. That, that's never going to happen. Because there's, there's a limit. I mean, we are, the, the, AD, the ADC that we have corrects down to 60 degrees centigrade, pretty well. But if you go beyond that, of course you're gonna have different. The alignment pixel to pixel, uh, that we've not gotten to that point of detail. We have to figure out if that's a need or not. I'm not sure that we need to do that. Do you think there are another proposal that are close to your proposal and maybe a decision of this committee could be to merge two proposals in one single proposal? Is it possible? Uh, it's always possible. Look, uh, the, the, the four projects, as I said, the four projects are public. So this study, well, by the way, if someone wants to have a look later, the, the study is here. I can also pass it to you, the PDF. Or, I mean, they are public. If you go to the Gemini webpage, it's not fully public, so there's part of the management part that's, that's not there, mm -hmm. but it's, it, the, the important information is all there. <coughs> so you can access that, I can pass you the information. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I see it complicated. Uh, the instruments are quite different, although they all go for pro, uh, broadband spectroscopy, intermediate resolution. Uh, I. I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't mind merging to another team. We did contact part of the other teams before, and uh, then they decided to go on their own. So, I mean, I personally would not have a problem in that, but uh, I don't see it happening, actually. I, I see it complicated. I think uh, everybody would like to build their own instrument, and uh, if we, I, I don't see an intermediate point between, for example, our instrument and one of the others. I see either one concept or the other concept. Maybe maybe you can choose to bring part of the other team to give you a hand because they are very good experts in some field. But but uh, I don't think that the the merge of, of the two concepts of the uh, of two concepts of those four is uh, really feasible. I would say. Yeah, uh, let's talk. Uh, so uh, my comments uh, uh, after hearing your talk, it gave me a feeling that your instrument is good for. What's that survey for individual targets? For, because for individual targets, we can use enough desktop and uh, spend more time with the uh, filters. Uh, so then, if you, uh, if uh, it's suitable for what's that survey, it means that the Gemini will spend uh, a lot of observation time for your instrument. Mm -hmm. That means that it will sacrifice the, the other instrument, the other instrument in the Gemini. So you, do you think it's possible, Gemini? Well, it depends on the policy that they want to follow afterwards. They are looking for this kind of instrument. So it's not us coming and saying, okay, this is what you have to do. It's what Gemini has asked us asked, asked to do. So it's in principle, it's their decision. Uh, the fact that it's going to be dedicated a lot of time or not, for sure we're not going to follow uh, all the targets of LSSD because that's going to be like 10,000 per night or something like that. So uh, you need to filter a lot and you need to decide what you want to do. Uh, I'm actually against the policy of, of using Gemini as a service telescope for LSSD. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion last uh, year. We were in Toronto in a meeting of the future science with, uh, with uh, Gemini and, uh, and the some some uh, person from LSST was there trying to convince us that that, that was the way to go to use uh, Gemini to support LSST for everything, and I'm not sure that's the strategy, and I'm I'm not sure that's what this instrument should do. We do want to follow a lot of those interesting targets, but not as a dedicated telescope. I don't know if it answers your question. To really achieve very high uh, time resolution, you would probably need an EM CCD rather than a frame transfer CCD. Have you considered uh, at least uh, putting that in one of the channels or in some strategy to really achieve uh, low noise, high time resolution? Yes, we had 
uh, at some point consider EMCCD detectors. The problem is their EMCCD detectors are good at high time resolution, right? Uh, but they are in imaging, they don't provide that much. In spectroscopy, they are, they are more useful. Actually, uh, and, and the one that could tell you more about that, and that selection, that choice, is, uh, is uh, Vic Dillon. I mean, he, he's probably one of the world experts in that. And, and I was hearing a talk last year in Evas from him, and, and uh, he was saying, yeah, in spectroscopy, yes, it's, it's true. It would be better, probably. Uh, in, uh, in imaging, still these detectors perform better. Uh, that's, and, and as we don't just want to do uh, a high time resolution, I mean, yeah, I want to also do normal observations. For us, it's better. Also, there's a problem of the, of the, of the format of the detectors, of the characteristics of the detectors. ECCDs <coughs> until now has been mainly a 1K by 1K. There are now some projects. Uh, some ideas to make 4K by 4K EMCC detectors, but that's still very preliminary, and we wouldn't want to base a design on something that's that's uh, not there. And uh, but yeah, we've considered it. I, we we thought that this was uh, a better way to go. Very high time resolution is uh, minimum minimum. We we can go down to say there somewhere. I think uh, 10 hertz in. So, so yeah, 10 images per second in full frame or uh, 100 images per second in uh, in windowed mode. So Vic was saying that he can go to 1,000 images per second with the same detectors. I mean, we're not going to push it as hard as that because we are not specialized only on that. So we, our idea was to make an instrument that can go very high time resolution without compromising any of the classic modes, which in the end will probably take a significant part of the telescope time. Do you support those frames and rates? Uh, yes, they are tricky to use. Southwest has been doing a lot of uh, study on that. Uh, so we do have the, the expertise in that. They are tricky. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, but partly you can. I mean, uh, I can put in contact with a person that, 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 uh, that is the expert on this. I, I know less about, about infrared detectors, so I, I cannot... Uh, Tell me much of the details, but apparently you you can you do pay you do pay a big price though. So right? Try to find that out if you know they can. I mean, ten hertz you can do with a Y two RG with a thing to side power. So one hertz definitely four, but they think ten hertz as well. I tried to find that out a few years ago, and you can do that. You have you have, is... you have to pay the price. I mean, of the detector but buying it, <laughs> and, and you have to pay the gets, price of the noise. It gets noisier, of course, but it's not that dramatic. But if you have a bright source that, that, that gives enough photons, and you want to go for the time resolution, you have it. Yeah. Okay. I will take an opportunity just to ask you the last question. Is that, uh, why did you not consider the multi-object spectroscopy? This is the only mode <laughs> in your instrument. Well, it is, it is not that, it is not that easy to make in, in, uh, in this. I mean, uh, there is a problem with multi-object spectroscopy in such a setup. And uh, it's that we are constrained to a single, I mean, we cover our, our main interest is to cover simultaneously the full range. Yeah. We have a long slit that would be in the middle of each of the detectors and spreading the light over the full detector. So in order to cover the full spectral range, we need the slit to be in the center. You, you could, in theory, you could put a multi-aperture yeah. uh, uh, focal plane like with a technology like the James Webb is going to have, if you have no level of money, and which is another problem, and, uh, and then you would have many objects. You could do multi-object spectroscopy, but you would not have the full range. And, okay. and you would have uh, windows that you don't control <laughs> of, uh, of losing uh, 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 spectral range. So, so no, there's some things we cannot do with a <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.